Bhagavatam Krantaraja Kija Jai Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Jan Madhyasya Yato Nivayad Itaratas Chate Swabhigya Swarat Jan Madhyasya Yatam Vaya Itaratas Chate Swabhigya Swarat Tene Brahma Hridaya Adhikavaye Muyanti Yatsurayaha Tene Brahma Hridaya Adhikavaye Muyanti Yatsurayaha Tejo Varimadam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Tisargo Mesha Tejo Varimadam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Tisargo Mesha Dhamna Svena Sada Nirashta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi Dhamna Svena Sada Nirashta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi O my Lord, Shri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva O my Lord, Shri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva O all-pervading personality of Godhead O all-pervading personality of Godhead From my respectful obeisances unto you are from my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute and truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. And the primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of manifested universes. Of the creation, sustenance, and the universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. Is he him. only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? Is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? The original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great uh, by him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation. Of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Of water seen in fire or land seen in water. Only because of him do the material universes. And because of him do, do the material universes. Temporarily manifested by reactions of the three modes of nature. Temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature. Appear factual, although they are unreal. Appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitra Vutra. Dharma Pujita Kaitra Vutra. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu. Vedyam Vastavam Astra Vastu. Shivadam Tapa Trayam Mulanam. Shivadam Tapa Trayam Mulanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kimva Parir Ishwara. Kim va paririshva. Sadyo hridi avarudya tetra. Sadyo ruddhi avarudya tetra. Kriti bhi susu subhistakshana. Kriti bhi susu subhistakshana. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in the heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth is the reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such a truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great maturity. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. Is sufficient itself. Well, what is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataro galitam phalam. Nigama kalpataro galitam phalam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur ahoraska bhuvibhavukaha. Muhur ahoraska bhuvibhavukaha. O ex Expert and thoughtful men relish Shrimad Bhagavatam. Who oh, expert and thoughtful men relish Shrimad Bhagavatam? The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami of Bhagavatam. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectar and juice was already relishable for all. 
including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna Kunya Shravana Kirtana Hiryan Taksto Hi Bhadrani Vidu Nati Suhitsatam To hear about Krishna from the uh, from the Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. Is it self-righteous activity? And for one who hears about Krishna, or Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart, becomes best wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. And Pius was devotee who is constantly engaged in hearing of him. Nasta praesu bhadresu. Nasta praesu bhadresu. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Nityam bhagavata sevaya. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhagavati uttama sloke. Bhakti bhavati nastiki. Bhakti bhavati nastiki. In this way, a devotee develops his, uh, his, his dormant transcendental knowledge. And this way, the devotee naturally develop is transcendental dharma. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from Shmar Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. By development of devotional service. By development of devotional service. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus material lust and avarice are diminished. And thus material lust and avarice become diminished. Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhakti Yogataha Bhagavat Bhakti Yogata Bhagavat Tattva Vigyana Bhagavat Tattva Vigyana Sangasya Jayate Mukta Sangasya Jayate When these purities and when these impurities are wiped away when these impurities are wiped away the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness the candidate remains steady in his position of pure becomes goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the the uh, science, science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Chidyante sarva samsaya. Chidyante sarva samsaya. Siyante chasya karmani. Chasya karmani. Drista evat manishwari. Drista evat manishwari. Thus bhakti yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. Thus bhakti yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. And enables one to come at once to the stage of assumption samagrama. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number 21. Oh, it's a very long purport. You know. We didn't discuss that whole purport yesterday. Okay. So we'll, we'll read some of this again. Well, we'll read the whole thing. With the progress of the age of Kali, four things particularly, namely the duration of life, mercy, power of recollection, and moral or religious principles will gradually diminish. Since Dharma, or the principles of religion, would be lost in the proportion of three out of four, this symbolic bull was standing on one leg only. When three-fourths of the population of the whole world become irreligious, the situation is converted into hell for the animals. In the age of Kali, godless civilizations will create so many religious societies in which the personality of Godhead will be directly or indirectly defied. And thus, faithless societies of men will make the world uninhabitable for the saner sections of people, for the saner section of people. There are gradations of human beings in terms of proportionate faith 
in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The first class faithful men are the Vaishnavas and the Brahmanas, then the Chatras, then the Vaishas, then the Sudras, then the Malachas, the Yavanas, and at last the Chandalas. Chandalas. The degradation of the human instinct begins from the Malacha and Chandala state of life is the last word in human degradation. All the above terms mentioned in the Vedic literatures are never meant for any particular community or birth. There are different qualifications of human beings, human beings in general. There is no question of birthright or community. One can acquire the respective qualifications by one's own efforts. And thus, the son of a Vaishnava can become a Malacha, or the son of a Chandala can become more than a Brahmana, all in terms of their association and intimate relation with the Supreme Lord. So this is extremely important. It emphasizes the effect of association. Now, you, we cannot really... Uh, explain this in uh, an enough because we take it for granted that oh I I'm not going to get influenced by bad association in fact I'm going to influence them that, that's not the case when you choose to associate too much with with uh, fallen people you become fallen and that includes teachers that includes uh, mentors, that includes tormentors, that includes everybody that is low class. You also become low class. Just like Sanatana and Rupa Goswami, they were born in Brahmana families. They were highly educated. They could speak three, four, five languages. They knew Sanskrit perfectly. Yet, they accepted this, the uh, work as a very high uh, persons in the in the government Nawab, Nawab Hussein Shah in Bengal. Bengal was a very wealthy uh, kingdom at that time, and they were uh, they received Muslim names, Dabir uh, Khas and uh, and so forth, and they were considered fallen. Why? Because they were serving people who were fallen and they were associating them with them regularly. But when they found out about Lord Chaitanya, uh, so they had already been, in a sense, rejected by the Brahmana community because of their close relationship with the Muslims. But when they found out about Lord Chaitanya, they were very attracted to him, and eventually they decided to give everything up. They gave up tremendous amount of wealth. I think Sanatan Goswami yeah, he had a whole boat full of gold, all right? So that's a lot of gold. And he was extremely rich. Both of them were extremely rich and powerful. They were, they were ruling over a country that had millions of people. But yet they gave everything up and they took the, the dress of beggars, uh, just one, one cloth, basically. And they became sannyasis, and they, uh, Lord Chaitanya asked them to go to Vrindavan and excavate the places of Krishna's pastimes, which were lost at that time. Over time, things deteriorate. There were no temples. There were just paddy fields. And they did that, and they rediscovered the places of Krishna's pastimes. They were able to build temples. But they themselves did not change their lifestyle as very strict sannyasis. In fact, Sanatan Goswami, he had a deity of Krishna, but he would hang it as a necklace around his neck. And every once in a while, he would, and every day he would put it on a branch of a tree and offer one or two dry chapatis without salt. <laughs> one day the deity spoke to him and was a little bit disturbed and said, Sanatan, he said, at least put some salt in the, in the roti. He said, my Lord, I can't do any, I can't give you something that you don't give me. So you have to be satisfied with the, the roti. So he had a very, very, very intimate relationship with Krishna. But he did build a wonderful temple, Bharata Madan Mohan. And that's another amazing story. And anyway, 
uh, what you see, these people were able, these, these, these great devotees were able to give up everything and just completely surrender to the Lord's instructions and they accomplished amazing things. They built, the, the, uh, they were able to build the seven uh, original temples of Vrindavan and they're still there today. And they were able to, at that time, you couldn't buy marble or stone without getting a special permission from the government of the Muslims in Delhi. And, but because they, they could speak Farsi and they could speak Urdu and they could speak Sanskrit, they knew how to deal with the Muslims, rulers, and they were able to get stone and marble to build new temples in Vrindavan. It's not an easy thing. Just like it's not an easy thing for us to get permission to build out our temple in Bellevue. And we're not dealing with antagonistic rulers. You know, we, uh, well, in a sense, you could say to someone antagonistic. But we have to, with so, many, so much red tape and, and codes and uh, people have to sign off, so many people have to sign off on the final permission so it takes a long time. They were able to do all that with, an, uh, let's say, an aggressive uh, government that didn't like them, right? But they knew how to deal with people. And uh, they were able to build these seven great temples of Vrindavan. And then after that, of course, many other temples appeared there. So these were exceptional persons who gave up the association, bad association, and they associated mainly with the villagers in Vrindavan who were relatively poor. And everybody liked them. There were, there were villagers in Vrindavan at that time. There were also dacoits at that time, just like there are today. But everybody liked them because they were completely surrendered to Lord Chaitanya. They slept under a different tree every night in other words, they didn't get attached to one place. They hardly ate, they hardly slept, and they were always discussing Krishna's pastimes, and they wrote these amazing literatures. They accomplished all these things without having a business, without having money, but having purity in their desire to serve the Lord. So association, here Prabhupada says, uh, one can acquire the, res okay, Prabhupada says, all the above terms mentioned in the Vedic literature are never meant for any particular community or birth. They are different qualifications of human beings in general. In other words, Brahmana, Chachya, Vaishya, Sudra. They're, they're general uh, qualifications by one's own efforts, not by birth. And thus the son of a Vaishnava can become a Malacha or the son of a Chandala can become more than a Brahmana, all in terms of their association and intimate relation with the Supreme Lord. That's the whole point right there. And we have to understand this. We're living in a, in a very, very negative uh, context. All around us are, uh, let's say, uh, temptations to break the regulative principles. And we associate with people in the normal course of, of life that are completely fallen. So we have to be extremely careful and merciful to help those who are a little bit innocent and to avoid those who are very demoniac. So it all depends on association and or intimate relation with the Supreme Lord. So if we're intimately related to Krishna and Krishna's devotees, we become and we remain devotees. If we're intimately related and associating with fallen people, we will become fallen, 100% guaranteed. No one is that strong that they can avoid. If Sanatana and Rupa Goswami were considered fallen by the Brahmanas, by their close association with the demons, then you can imagine what our condition will be if we closely associate with demoniac persons. And demoniac persons, the first qualification is they eat meat. They uh, like to gamble and speculate. They engage in illicit activities and they take intoxicants. 
Okay. So the meat eaters are generally called malexas, but all meat eaters are not malexas. Those who accept meat in terms of scriptural injunctions are not malexas, but those who accept meat without restriction are called malexas. So here is the question, okay, well, are the Muslims uh, malexas because they're supposed to eat halal meat and the animal is sacrificed according to their scriptural or their, uh, well anyway, if you, if you go by their scripture, uh, whether it's the Jews or the Muslims, both they have halal or kosher meat, uh, are they actually following their scriptural injunction? The scriptural injunction, according to the Bible, is there should not be one drop of blood in the flesh. That is almost impossible to attain. In previous times, the Jews, after they killed the animal and, and, and bled it to death, according to their scriptural uh, method, then they kept the meat in a solution of brine, that means a salt solution, for at least three weeks to a month or more, hoping that every drop of blood would go out of the meat. So, and then the meat was never red, it was always gray at that point because it also uh, oxidized somewhat. And then they would eat it. So is it possible to get all the blood out of the meat? I don't think so. Therefore, uh, it, the restriction is so severe that uh, it's not worth the risk because in the Bi at least the Bible says if, if you eat one drop of blood in the meat, then your blood will be taken. In other words, you will basically be punished for uh, that uh, breach of the code. So when there's a very strict code for something, it's better not to even touch it. You see? Just like they say, don't eat, you know, sometimes people say, you know, they go to a restaurant and they say, uh, give me a rare steak. Well, that means, you know, hardly cooked, right? They, they consider that a delicacy. But the health department says, you have to cook it to 160 degrees and hold it at that temperature for a certain period of time. You know, they, they have a warning uh, about meat. There's no warning about eating an apple. They don't say, you have to keep it in the oven for at least a half an hour at 160 degrees. No, you can eat the apple, <laughs> there's no rules about it. But they put rules on the meat, you know. They don't enforce it, like you don't go to jail if you break the rule, but they warn you that you could get E. coli and other diseases. And a lot of people get diseases from, the, uh, from meat. They used to get mad cow disease. You get uh, E. coli infection and die, right? So eating meat is actually a dangerous thing. People don't realize it. And that's why the health department gives so many rules. So when something has a lot of rules to it, better not to touch it, especially when it's severe like this, uh, where, where God is saying, at least in the Old Testament, you eat one drop of blood in the flesh of the animal, then, then your blood will be taken. Okay, so the people of the age will not perform any sacrifice. So can we, can we say that someone who's following the religious way of eating meat is not a malecho or a chandala? Well, I would say that, well, first of all, the Muslims do eat cows. They don't just eat goats. So in that sense, they are very sinful. And sometimes, uh, like in India, they'll force a Hindu to eat meat uh, just so that he'll give up his religious... Well, nowadays, they don't have to force them. They, they, most of the Hindus eat meat. But uh, Previously, they would force Hindus to eat meat. So the people of the sage will not perform any sacrifice. The Malecha population will care very little for performance of sacrifices, although the performance of sacrifice is essential for persons who are materially engaged in sense enjoyment. In the Bhagavad Gita, the performance of sacrifice is strongly recommended. In three, uh, third chapter, 14th verse to 16th verse. So why does it say that uh, the performance of sacrifice is essential 
for persons who are materially engaged in sense enjoyment? Well, it's to diminish the weight or the load of sins that they're performing. It doesn't mean it gives, they, they give up the desire to sin, but it diminishes the load of sins that they have. And therefore, even the Hindus are recommended to do Satya Narayana Puja once a month. It's not like once a year, it's supposed to be once a month. Because they, after they finish the puja, they feel relieved, and then they go back and start sinning again. So they have to do it next month again, and so forth. So it's best uh, to just do the Harinam Sankirtan Yagya. This is the easiest Yagya, and the effect of the holy name, if you chant sincerely, it, you, you eventually give up the desire to sin. That's more important than uh, simply uh, sinning and then doing some sacrifice to re reduce the load of sin. The, the, you don't reduce the load of sin by doing uh, sacrifices for material benefit. It's only when you actually perform the holy, holy name or chant the holy name of Krishna sincerely that your load of sinful, that your desire to sin is not only the sins, but the desire to sin is purified and you become actually free. The living beings are created by the creator Brahma and just to maintain the created living being progressively toward the path back to Godhead, the system of performing sacrifice is also created by him. The system is that the living beings live on the produce of grains and vegetables and by eating such food stuff, they get vital power of the body in the shape of blood and semen and from blood and semen, one living being is able to create other living beings. But the production of grains, grass, etc. becomes possible by rain, and thus rain is made to shower properly uh, by performance of recommended sacrifices. So he's talking in the third chapter here, uh, in his, what he says, Anad Bhavanti Bhutani Parjanyad Anasambhava. So that's an important verse. And it says, it's verse 14, yajna bhavati sam parjan yo yajna karma samud bhava. All living bodies exist, subsist on food grains which are produced from rains. Rains are produced by performance of yagya or sacrifice, and yagya is born of prescribed duties. So, following the regulations, rules and regulations of Krishna consciousness, you're following prescribed duties. And by chanting Hare Krishna, you're performing Jagya, Harinam Sankirtan Yagya, which is the recommended Yagya, the only one that a, uh, a person can correctly perform in this age of Kali. And by performance of regulated Yagyas, you get rains, regulated rains. And when you have regulated rains, you get regular production of grains. So that's, Prabhupada said, this is practical. This is something that is essential for the maintenance of human beings. And because of eating grains, you're, you develop more blood or you develop a good quantity of blood. And from the blood, there is semen, then there's reproduction and humanity continues. Why is that? Because uh, souls fall down as, uh, with the rain and and they become, they become absorbed by the grains and they become uh, present in the grain. And this way, uh, uh, grains are extremely important for nutrition, more important than vegetables and, and fruits and, and so forth. If you have grains and milk, all your food necessity is taken care of. Okay, so... Uh, the, but the production of grains, grass, etc., becomes possible by rain, and this rain is made to shower properly by performance of recommended sacrifices. Such sacrifices are directed by the rites of the Vedas, namely Sama, Yajur, Rig, and Atharva. In the Manasamiti, it is recommended by offering that by offering of sacrifice on the altar of fire, the sun god is pleased. When the sun god is pleased, he properly collects water from the sea and thus sufficient clouds collect on the horizon and rains fall. So you see, there's a whole system that's, in a sense, 
dependent on yajna. And if people don't perform these yajnas, whether it's the Karmakanda yajnas or whether it's the Harinam Sankirtan yajna, then there's problems in society. Nature does not cooperate because nature is controlled by the demigods. And if they see a whole population of impious people, then there is uh, what you call interruption of the natural cycle of uh, rain and, and sun and so forth. And then that spells trouble. After sufficient rains fall, there's sufficient production of grains for men and all animals, and thus there is, a, there is energy in a living being for progressive activity. The Malechas, however, make plans to install slaughterhouses for killing the bulls and cows, because it's easier. You just let the cows eat grass and get fatty and then kill them and eat them. You don't have to plow the land. You don't have to uh, throw the seeds on the land. You don't have to uh, pray for rains or anything. You just let them walk around and eat the grass or like they do in India, just eat junk in the street. And then you kill them and you make money and you eat. See? So this, is, this shows how fallen and disgusting people have become. And then uh, the Malachas, however, make plans to install slaughterhouses for killing bulls. Uh, in India, you have over 36,000 slaughterhouses, three, six, and with three zeros after it. Whereas in around, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, there was not one slaughterhouse in India. And uh, now there's 36,000, so you can understand why there's problems in India. But they must know that even for the animals, they must produce grass and vegetables. Otherwise, the animals cannot live. And to produce grass for the animals, they require sufficient rains. Therefore, they have to depend ultimately on the mercy of the demigods like the sun god and Indra and Chandra. And such demigods must be satisfied by performance of sacrifice. So if you talk, if you teach, talk to your teachers or you talk to people about this, they say, are you crazy? We can make rain artificially. We can, we can seed cows. We're so advanced in science. It's a bunch of nonsense. But they talk about that. And they, they don't think that there's any background arrangement in the universe. And they don't believe in demigods. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in anything. They just say, oh, we, we'll take care of all this with our science. Right? And look at the mess they're in. All over the world now, one little virus has crippled whole countries and uh, one earthquake or one uh, tsunami or one hurricane can cripple a whole country or a whole part of a country. And then if that's not enough, there's war and people killing each other and bombs and all kinds of drones now and drone swarms and with, with the, which are individual bombs. So, so you see, there are huge problems in the world because no one believes that there's a background arrangement. And here we're reading this. Now, if, if we read this to somebody, let's say, Krishna, you go to school and you read this to somebody, you think they would believe it in your classroom? No, they would not believe it. But yet, they're suffering and they don't know why. And they think that by some kind of science or technology, they're going to solve all these problems. It's not a fact. It's a, whole, it's a pipe dream. It's an empty promise. Anyway, you see, Prabhupada has analyzed all these things. The material world is a sort of prison house. As we have several times mentioned, the demigods are the servants of the Lord who see to the proper upkeep of the prison house. These demigods want to see that the rebel living beings who want to survive faithlessly are gradually turned towards the supreme power of the Lord. Therefore, the system of offering sacrifices is recommended in the scriptures. So, as long as people are not doing this, they're suffering. And because they're suffering, eventually some people will, will, will come up to a devotee and say, can you explain why I'm suffering? I don't understand, and I'm sick and tired of it. So that's when the devotees have to be like first responders. They have to know, uh, they have to be trained just like uh, a nurse is trained to be a first responder until the ambulance comes, or people know how to do what's called what? What is it called? The uh, huh? 
yes, CPR, until the ambulance comes and then the person could be uh, taken away to the hospital and treated by the professional doctors. So devotees have to have the CPR training. That is, in 30 seconds, one minute, you have to give such a shot to a person that asks you a question that they, they get shocked out of their uh, stupor and they say, you know, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I don't have to eat all this meat and kill animals. I don't have to have abortions. I don't have to uh, drink uh, and take drugs. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. That's actually my real problem. He's breaking these principles. Maybe I should believe that there is a God. See? So uh, you have to be trained. You're a first responder. But if you have no training and you yourself are influenced by the demons, then you're just going to suffer and not understand why it's happening, even though the information is there. There's no lack of information. There's no lack of the truth. The only thing that's lacking is a person's determination to learn it and practice it. That's the only thing that's lacking. But that determination you will not get by associating with demons. You only get it in the association of devotees. That's the main point. That's why Prabhupada wanted these temples. That's why he wanted the temples to be regulated and clean and have regular classes. Otherwise, it's impossible to understand this. And you can see it. You go and read it to someone and say, I don't believe that. That's, that's a bunch of fairy tales. That's what you believe. That's your religion. And I got my religion. And my religion says I can eat meat. There you go. You know, that's the problem. Even their religion is cheating them. Okay, so we'll stop right there. Are there any questions? Let me just run, finish that last point. Yeah. Even the excess rain is also, how do we interpret the excess rain? I think we're seeing an average. Someone's chanting more than 